short number of uh, topics which are interesting, I think, as background knowledge and uh, motivation also for Boom, which I maybe logically this lecture will become the first one, but hopefully one will introduce Boom in a little bit. So. Um, but um, there will be also a certain number of comments on confusion about quantum mechanics, which have been around in the literature, maybe not so much now, but they've been for and I think it's important to clarify. So let me start with an objection which you made yesterday. That, you know, what is so special about positions? Why not introduce hidden variables like, you know, hidden variable by definition is anything beyond the wave function for all observables? There are two answers. One which I've given already is that all measurements are ultimately measurements of position. Spin, depending whether you go up or down, but also energy and the momentum, etc. Even in classical mechanics, all these things are function of the trajectory. So if you get the trajectory right, the energy does not exist in the sense. All there is in classical mechanics is motion of particles. <coughs> now, of course, there is, a, there is a surface in phase space on which they are uh, stuck, which is the energy surface. So if you recover the statistical prediction of quantum mechanics for the position, and we do, we recover the statistical prediction for all of them. There is no need for other hidden variables if you think about it. And that's the example given by Matthias. <coughs> you see that he, you can introduce a spin hidden variable, but then it just goes along with the position and doesn't add anything to uh, the theory. Of course, Bell says that, and Bell gives a simple argument, he says everything is positioned. For example, it could be traces of ink on the printout. If you do an experiment, eventually you get that. And these are position of particles. Some people say, well, you could correlate that to see, uh, you know, light that result in terms of light, but all results could be expressed in terms of position. But there is a deeper reason, which is introducing hidden variable for all observable is impossible. And this is the content of this talk, at least the beginning, which is the no hidden variable theory. And there's a lot of confusion because people say, ha ha, people are proven that no uh, hidden variable are impossible or non-local, we'll get back to that. Well, you have to ask what hidden variables are impossible. Okay, position hidden variables are not impossible, the proof is the existence of Bell's theory. Uh, Bell's theory. In showing that we disprove once and for all the naive statistical interpretation, as well as clarify things like quantum logic. Anyway, the measure of this talk is what I said before, that measurement of measure and observation of observation. So let me <coughs> explain what I mean by the naive statistical interpretation of quantum mechanics, which I believe is in the mind of most physicists who don't care about quantum mechanics. So when you go home, you can go to your professor and say, ah, oh, you don't worry about that. So now you do so Socratic method, you ask question, question, you, you get to that, and then you say, boom, it's So the algorithm, I just repeat what I said, you have this unitary evolution, which is Schrodinger equation. And you have a so-called observable, it's a self adjoint operator. It has a basis, if it has a basis of eigenvector, vector, then you have the probability of the result of measurement, and after that the state collapsed and is reduced to psi i. One possible worry, which is certainly a real worry, is that there are two mutually incompatible rules of evolution. One, what about outside of measurement, and one that happens during measurement. Now, what would your colleague who don't worry would answer to that. What would the no worry physicists say? Well, they say measurements reveal pre existing properties of the system, and the quantum state gives the statistical distribution of those properties. The collapse rule then simply comes from the fact that you change one's probabilities after an observation since you just learned something about the system. You just learned that the system had, you know, value lambda i for observable a. Just like coin flipping. You flip coin, if you don't look on which face the coin fell, you assign a point one half to each face. If you look, the point is jump to zero and one, depending on which one is above. You learn something. So you change the probabilities. Bayesian updating, nothing strange there. What's mysterious about quantum mechanics? There's nothing. Isn't that just like that in quantum mechanics? Some people say, well, it's not the same because they're not commuting operator, there's interference, and they're not sure that it's quite that simple. 
But in the back of their mind, they know where the physicists have something like that. That's not the real reason. I told you the real reason. Let me formalize this idea and then show you that it's, it doesn't work. But I have to say it precisely mathematically. So for every individual system with a given quantum state psi, there would exist a map from the set of observables to the real, such that for every observable, V of A, would be the pre-existing but unknown value of the observable A for an individual system. Uh, so part to, of to, to clarify, for, for a given quantum state, you would think it's a random such map, or yeah, a yeah, probability yeah, yeah. distribution yeah, the, of such map. That's what I said. Yeah, yeah, I go to that. Then the Psi would give the probability distribution about this value map. V is the value map, so the particle comes here. Before measurement, it has the value of the spin in one direction, the value of the velocity or the angular momentum or whatever. We don't know what it is. And of course, when we prepare a given state, it all means we prepare an ensemble of system with the same probability distribution, but different uh, individual realization of the value map. Okay? So the value map, of course, must be known to the values of A. The quantum state would give you a probability distribution of all those maps following the quantum algorithm. So I repeat the quantum algorithm introducing the value map. So if A is like that, psi is decomposed on the basis, then the probability that the value of A be lambda i, not the result of measurement, but the pre-measurement value of A is equal to ci squared. This value pre-exists to measurement has nothing to do with them. The measurements don't create that value, they just discover it and they just reveal the value. Okay? Okay. If that was true, there would be no problem in quantum mechanics. And I think many people think it's true. I mean, they don't say it because, you know, I formalize the notion and say, in the back of the mind, you can say, oh, that, no, it's okay, you know. This value map is sometimes called non-contextual because it has the same value for all measurements of A. You could measure A different ways, like for measurement of spin, I said you could orient the field in that direction or the opposite direction, and the way wrong is different values. It's just uh, an indication. You could think, this value does not depend on the arrangement of the apparatus, nor on whether you measure simultaneously with A an operator B that, B that commutes with A. Because you can measure simultaneously with commuting operators. That's all my quantum mechanics. Now, the new hidden Bible theorems just refute, mm -hmm. just destroy them. And it's extraordinarily little known, these theorems. You can go to Conference on Quantum Foundation. I'm not talking about you, I'm talking about the, the experts. They don't know these theorems. And they make mistakes mm -hmm. because they don't know these theorems. So, theorem one, there are five theorems. There does not exist a map from the set of matrices, or I can call it operator, but it's in finite dimensional space, at least three. For example, spin matrices and their product, such that for all A, B in that set of operators, V of A belongs to the eigenvalue of A. And if A be commute, then V of A plus B is V of A plus B plus B. V of A plus B. So the algebraic relation is maintained if they commute, which is a prediction of quantum mechanics. So quantum mechanics, independently of which state you consider, this is independent of the state, this is algebra. It has nothing to do with the particular upside. Just a theorem doesn't exist. <coughs> There's a similar theorem, which was a proof simplified due to David Merman, which is exactly the same thing. There is no map, so that. And the condition now, what you assume is that when they commute, the value of the product is the product of the value, which again is a prediction of quantum mechanics. So if the values have to be revealed by the observation, they must satisfy these two rules. Okay? And there is no such map. You don't use the quantum formalism at all except for these two rules. If they commute, then the value of the sum is the sum of the value, and the value of the product is the and they are satisfied by the quantum predictions. The quantum, now the upshot is that the quantum state cannot give a probability distribution on things that do not exist, namely these value maps. Okay? You can't have that. That's the end of the statistical interpretation, which exists. I mean, it exists. There are books of it, like in Valentine or something. People have developed this. Uh, there were people like, uh, there were Soviet physicists who were doing that too. And, uh, I mean, you wanted to say something? Just a comment. Your requirements, uh, they're not uh, special, at least about product. If you have pre-postulated system, 
Yeah, with AMB commute, mm. and then uh, there is no product rule. So it's uh, not, uh, I think, the, the assumption to looking for such a thing. I'm just taking all my quantum mechanics. Only quantum mechanics will predict that these changes are satisfied. I'm not looking at the ordinary quantum mechanics. If it's That's a what I'm doing. No, no, system. no. But I'm not pre <coughs> what's, what's forbid us to, mm -hmm. to consider the So I, I, I think the statement here would be the following. If you first make a measurement of A, then uh, you make a measure, uh, an ideal quantum measurement of B. <coughs> then uh, uh, the, the collapse state will be in the eigenspace of the, uh, of the operator AB with eigenvalue. You take the value outcome for A times the outcome for B. Actually, so that's, measure, that's a clear B statement. Would be a part, would be, that would be a valid measurement of quantum mechanics. You could measure A and B and then make the product. The measurement of, it's a different measurement. If you measure A separately and B separately, or you measure product, is in Van Neumann, in standard quantum mechanics, it's a different measure. If they don't commute, then if they no, commute. commute. No, no, but they can be commute. If they commute. No, they okay, can. That, that, that's why, I, in, in my version of the statement, I stated it ex explicitly, how to do it. So I said, if you first make an A measurement, then make, an <coughs> make a B measurement, then uh, your quantum state afterwards will also be in an eigenspace of A times B, and the eigenvalue will be the product of the two outcomes that you had before. So that's a precise sense in which the observable A, B afterwards has the, uh, the value uh, outcome of the kind of outcome. You see, you are, trying to, you are trying to make sense of the fact that it might have value before measurements, independently of measurements, and that the measurements would reveal those values. And if they do, then they should satisfy the rules for quantum prediction. But but I'm not going to pre and post so The comment that it's not, that it's usually people use this product rule, but I think it's <coughs> there is no good motivation. But <laughs> the motivation is that you find it in every statistical quantum mechanical textbook that this is true. You can uh, in everything they say, well, if A one A N are commuting observable, then you can measure them simultaneously in order to make correlation are satisfied. Anyway, let's not get into a discussion about that because I think you go back to one, one, I mean people who have had only quantum mechanics probably know that as follows. Anyway, so the statistical view, which is the most natural one, is alternative. And it's sometimes called, or at least I call it, or some friend of mine call it naive realism about with respect to operators. So you think operators correspond to quantities attributed to the system. And I will use this uh, M R A in Google. Measurements don't measure. They in some sense act on the system, but how? In all the quantum mechanics, they are a deus ex machina. So, only in the more detailed theory, like the world boom, you can explain how they act. But in all the quantum mechanics, you just say, well, by fiat, you reduce the state. So, the outline of the proof of theorem one, which is due to Cochrane and Speckler, who are mathematicians, you don't need to assume that the map is defined on all operators. Can, can you remind us again what theorem one said? With the sum of Okay? And theorem 2 is with the product. So what they take is they take a spin 1 system and take spin matrices for spin associated to three dimensional, uh, three dimensional set of orthogonal vectors. And the standard quantum mechanics operators have the properties that the eigenvalues of those guys are zeros or one. They commute. The S is not commute, but the S square commute, and the sum of the square must be two. So I repeat these three rules there, and from the assumption that V of A, so the value must be zero and one for all of those guys, and if since when since they commute, the sum rule implies that the triple there you have to have three numbers which are zeros and one and add up to two. So the only possibility is, is 1, 1, 0, 1, 0, 1, or 0, 1, 1. Okay? This is follows from the assumptions here. These are the only possibilities for these eigenvalues. So the triple must be either that. But that must hold for every set of three-dimensional orthogonal vectors, because I haven't told you which one I take. I could take any, any set of vectors in R3. 
In Gokan and Speaker, that's now clever geometry, we're able to find a finite number of such sets so that the above assumption on the value taken leads to a contradiction. Like that, three quarters, we are one. I mean, you, you just have to play with 117 such sets. I don't know how they managed to do that, but they could do that and Perez reduce it to 33 afterwards. Never mind what the finite number. Even if it was an infinite number, I don't care that you get a contradiction. Then there is another thing, okay. Theorem 2, the proof of Theorem 2, uh, that's, that was an exercise. In one of the exercises you were given, and the calculation, I think, is done in the appendix of these notes. Okay? So I won't go to Theorem 2. We mentioned Theorem 3, because that's even less known than Theorem 1 and 2, because that's a theorem due to a guy like Young, I think, Clifton. Now you take a wave function, which is a function of at least two real variables. So could be one particle in two dimensions or two particles on the line. Then it's well known that the position operators act by multiplication and the momentum act by differentiation. That's the, we can define it by multiplication and Fourier transform. These are the standard position and momentum operators. Now consider the set of functions, analytic function of one of the operators, and do the product of such guys, okay? So you take all the function of position and momentum and you take the product of that, defining self adjoint operator. Then there is no map from those set of operators into R, so that for every function, the value of the function is a function of the value, which again should be true according to quantum mechanics. And again, when they commute, the value of the product is the product. So measurements of momentum must also be contextual, since position moment measurements do measure the little position. Yeah, at least in, in the boy boom theory, the measurement of momentum must be something subtle for two particles. I mean, I explained already that measurement of momentum in the boy boom does not reveal the true value of the velocity, but it does reveal a value which is actually related to the initial position of the particle, and so there is a value map in that case. But when you take two particles, you can arrange things so that measurement of one, depending on how you measure one, will affect the measurement of the other. And so uh, you, know, the, this, this, uh, you can show that uh, uh, in the very world, you don't have this value map. OK, so that's, that's, uh, that shows there are many uh, no-go theorem if you wish, and you have to be worried about that. Now, the first Noyden variable theorem, which was invented by von Neumann, who is of course a genius, uh, but it was a very silly theorem. He, he made the same assumption as before, but when A and B do not commute. So without this provision, it's, it's like a conspecular. Okay? And the proof is almost trivial, because you take A to be the spin x direction, B in the y direction, and you make this combination there, and that's a spin at 45 triangle between x and y. All those matrices are value equal to plus minus one. So the value of a and b must be plus minus one, but the value of this must be plus minus one. And if you have the addition, then v of a plus b must be plus minus square root of two, but v of a plus v of b is plus minus two or zero because it's plus the addition. You do the addition of two numbers which are plus or minus one, so the result must be plus or minus two or zero, so the, the, the sum rule does not hold, okay? So that's the proof of von Neumann. Von Neumann gave a different proof. The reason why von Neumann postulated this is probably because it holds when you have control about a hidden variable. So assuming hidden variables like that for a given quantum state means that the value of those variables vary between different experiments and the quantum state determines the probability of the distribution, as I said before, and as other dimensions. So if you have a over those variables, and if the variable agree with the quantum mechanical prediction, you have the expectation value of V of A, because the expectation value of V of B is the expectation value of the sum, where E is this average. Indeed, that holds because the expectation value is given in a quantum state by Psi A Psi. That will give you the average uh, value of the result of measurement if you do measurement. But if you assume that these are pre-existing value, then of course you have to assume that rule 
and that of course is this is the translation of that. Okay? We never use anything but this selection calculation. But the very much you know some some of the Yeah, but I'm talking about individual experiments. I'm asking whether in an individual experiment there could be values of observable before you measure them. I'm talking about individual system. And I'm showing it's impossible. Now maybe you don't care because you are interested in statistics. Okay, we're not talking about that. We're trying to understand what happens in single systems. Okay? And I, the naive view is very, very common. So I, I think it's worth understanding why it's true. But of course, saying that an identity holds on average, then you may assume it holds for every value over which the average is taken. It's like saying that if a function satisfies the integral of f t being zero for a certain probability measure, then you must assume that f of x is zero for all x. That's not exactly a natural assumption for a mathematician to make. Moreover, Bell constructed a simple example of hidden spin variable that reproduced the quantum result for a single spin. So now, in von Neumann, you don't have two spins, you have one spin in the proof of von Neumann. And so if the proof, if the assumption was uh, uh, not uh, unreasonable, that would refute this example constructed by Bell, which is also in his book. But the funny thing with von Neumann, he wasn't exactly modest about his result. When he gave his theorem, he said it is not, as is often assumed, a question of a reinterpretation of quantum mechanics. The present system of quantum mechanics would have to be objectively false in order that another description of the elementary processes than the statistical one be possible. So he's basically saying I've proven that both is impossible. Actually, he did this in 1932, and the Breuer had already given his idea in 1927, but it was sort of no, not known. It, the similar conclusion was drawn by Max Born, Wolfgang Pauli, and lesser figures. On the other hand, Bell was very critical. He said in 1932, John von Neumann gave a rigorous mathematical proof stating that he couldn't find an unsatisfactory theory that would give the same prediction as quantum mechanics. That von Neumann proof in itself is one that must someday be the subject of a PhD thesis for a history student. So if you are a history student here or somebody turn to a history of physics, that's certainly a very interesting thesis. His reception was quite remarkable. The literature will be full of respectful references to premium proof of von Neumann, but I do not believe it could have been read at that time by more than two or three people. Then people repeat, oh, von Neumann, you know, this genius is proven that. And then that was an interview with a new magazine called Omni, and said, why is that? Well, the fishes didn't want to be bothered with the idea that maybe quantum theory is unprovisional. The horn of plenty has been spilled before them. And every physicist could find something to apply quantum mechanics to. They were pleased to think that this great mathematician had shown it was so. Yet the von Neumann proof, if you actually come to grips with it, full apart in your hands, so the proof I gave, there is nothing to it. It's not just full, it's silly. If you look at the assumption he made, may, does not hold that of a moment. It's the work of a mathematician, and he makes assumptions that have a mathematical symmetry to them. When you translate them into terms of physical disposition, they are nonsense. You may quote me on that. The proof of von Neumann is not merely false, but foolish. So that is a great for life in general. So that's a very strong statement. <laughs> so I want to make a little more for the tale now, as I do in all my talks. Uh, there is a guy named Jacob Schwartz, which most of you don't know, but in the 50s, Dunford and Schwartz have written a book of functional analysis, very abstract, very dense and complete, and so on, the sort of the Bible of abstract mathematics and analysis. And uh, he recounted in 1963, I think, at the Berkeley Congress of Mathematicians, and he was criticizing the, the use of rigor in physics. I'm a mathematical physicist, so I sort of had to swallow this criticism. But here is what he says The intellectual attractiveness of a mathematical argument as well as the considerable mental labor involved in following it, makes mathematics a powerful tool of intellectual prestigitation, a glittering deception in which some are entrapped and some, alas, entrap us. Uh, can, can you explain the word prestigitation? <laughs> <laughs> prestigitation. <laughs> <laughs> well, it's a uh, trick, consumer trick. Okay, it's, uh, because for Neumann, it's that. He says, okay, I've proven that there's no <coughs> way to have an answer to 
different interpretation of quantum mechanics, but then you look at the assumptions, you see. Of course, in this case, it's not true that it's considerable mental labor, but the whole book of von Neumann with the operator, hyperspace, and so that was quite an achievement. But the theorem showing the completeness of quantum mechanics is not. This was Jacob Schwartz was actually speaking in some part, not about von Neumann theorem, but about quantum mechanics and also statistical, and the discipline statistical mechanics. You should read that. You should read that paper. It's called The Pernicious Influence of Mathematics in Science. So Schwartz is saying that sometimes uh, mathematical proofs are used for deception. Well, maybe not consciously, but implicitly. Yes, that's what he said. Well, for my opinion, it's wrong. Well, he thinks that there's too much emphasis on rigor in certain models that physicists know are not quite correct. And then they would add terms to the Hamiltonian, and then the assumptions of, uh, that we make are not correct anymore, yet they use these modified models, and then the work done on the simplified model may not be as relevant. Anyway, you should read it. It's three pages. You can find it on the web. But Bell Arts, in 1952, I saw the impossible God. was in paper by Bohm. Bohm explicitly how, showed how parameters could be introduced with the help of which the deterministic description could be transformed into a deterministic one. More importantly, in my opinion, the subjectivity of the object observation, the necessary reference to the observer, could be eliminated. Then why, then at Bohm, because Bohm gave a series of popular lectures in 1948, I think, and von Neumann's uh, book was translated in English in 1955, only, it was written in German in 32, and so Bell did not know German, so he couldn't read von Neumann's book, so he read the summary of the popular lecture by Bohm, 1948, and he said, why well, didn't tell me about that? You know, only to point out what was wrong with it, why did von Neumann not consider it? More extraordinary, why did people go on producing impossibility proof after 1952, and as recently as 1978? Well, it's surprising. Now, I have the theorem 5, which I already discussed, so I won't discuss, I will just remind you. Bell's theorem is also a non numerical theorem. But combined with the EPR argument, it's a non locality proof. But remember, we had this picture yesterday, the tree orientation, okay, and the two particles always go in opposite directions, so they are correlated. That holds for this state, which I've written yesterday, and then you seem to be forced to introduce random variable, A of alpha plus or minus one, labeled in the direction, and where the alpha means the particle will go in the direction of the field, it's plus one, opposite direction, it's minus one, and the same thing for B. And the perfect anti-correlation implies this. <coughs> These random variables are hidden variables, if you wish, and Bell showed that simply assuming that they exist leads to a contradiction. But that, of course, is a different proof than the, the other ones, because it's not purely algebraic. It depends on certain states. It's, uh, uh, there are many new and variable theorem which depend on certain states. If a state is a certain form, then we can show that there are no uh, hidden variables. But of course, this proves on locality, since this assumption was a way to say locality. This proof is done specifically for this combination of A by B now. Yeah. Well, because it's in that state that the prediction of one quarter holds to use that. You use always quantum prediction, prediction so you use always standard quantum mechanics prediction, but, and which are checked by observation. But of course, it depends here on that particular setup. Another reminder, which I will go quickly over, is how does the double bone theory avoid being refuted by the non reliable theory? Because that's a constant, constant source of confusion. Because, ah, ah, but there are no hidden variable theorem. So, boom, is a hidden variable theory, so it can't both work. No! It's not a, a hidden variable theory. It introduces hidden variables that are position. And there's never been a theorem showing that you can't introduce position. You can't do position and momentum. Spin, that's true. So, it does not introduce hidden variables for quantities other than position. And again, I remind you quickly of the stern Gerlach setup. You have the field in that direction. The wave function is a superposition of up and down. The up part goes up, the down part goes down. And then if the particle is here, it will go up. 
when the field is in that direction, so it will be uh, with the spin up. That means, by the way, that if you do a further measurement on that particle, then you will find the particle going in the direction of the field. There is no, there is no superposition anymore. It has been reduced. If the particle is in the upper part, so it does that, that's, but it cannot cross the middle line, that's because again of this picture. Now repeat the same experiment with the field reserve, exactly the same position, same thing. And then, of course, it has still to go up, but now because the field is reversed, the minus part goes there, the upper part goes there, and the down part goes there, the up part goes there, so now the particle will have its spin down, and uh, so it changes the value of the spin depending on the orientation of the operator, uh, the measuring device, and not just of the electron. Okay? So now let me get to some uh, sort of. I, I'm finished with the noise environment, term, but I want to draw some more general conclusion about things that have been around in the literature and which I think are if not refuted, at least partly refuted by the mm -hmm. One thing is quantum logic. That was again initiated by Berkhoff and von Neumann. Of course, again, the same von Neumann, so he's a genius, but almost everything he did in physics is misinterpreted, but in mathematics he's a genius. So if you have P and Q are proposition, now I'm going to back to elementary logic, you say that you write P or Q, P and Q, and the negation of P. That's what you want, operation of that okay? Now you can do the same operation with subset of a set. You can take the union of the set, the intersection, and the complement. They correspond to the logical operation. Think of A as a set of elements for which proposition P holds, and B, the set of elements for which proposition Q holds, and then P or Q would correspond to A union B, and this is what you want. The algebraic structures have certain property of distributiveness. They, can, they are distributed. So if you take P, uh, Q or Q prime, and P and Q or Q prime, then it's P uh, or Q union P or Q prime. I mean, uh, you can read them as well as I can. And they form what is called a Boolean algebra. Mm -hmm. Never mind what Boolean algebra is, but it's the structure behind this distribution. Now consider subspaces of a vector space, a vector space. You can do something similar. If you want P or Q, you take the union of E and F, and you take the smaller subspace containing the union of subspaces E and F. If you want uh, P and Q, that's the intersection. And if you want the non-P, you take the ortho complement of P. Okay? Again, so you can play the same thing. Logic, sets, subspace. But the previous structure, but it doesn't have the distributive property. Because for vector space, if you take the space uh, spanned by F and G, Intersection E, that's not the same thing as the intersection of E with F, and the intersection <coughs> of E with G, and then creating the space it produces. Take, for example, F the x-axis, G the y-axis, and E the line y equals x. Okay? Then F and G will generate R2. Therefore, E intersected the plane R2 will be the line y equals x. But E intersect E, F, and E intersect G are just equal to the point zero to intersect the x-axis with the axis, okay? So this rule does not hold. As far as mathematics is concerned, uh, speaking of this space of subsets, uh, looking at their properties, that's okay, it may be nice, but there has been a tendency to associate subspaces of H with proposition. This size a quantum state, A an operator, and here a subspace of eigenvectors vectors of A, you could ask, does the system whose quantum state is psi have the property associated with the eigenvalue associated to E? And I've already said you should be worried about speaking about properties of, of quantum system independently of measurement. 
because they don't have power, they bone, they don't have any power. The answer to that question could be given by a measurement of operator A or of the projector on the subspace E, and the answer would be yes or no, and then there's the popular idea that quantum mechanics is just a series of yes, no questions. Okay? There's been a lot of uh, literature, I mean, not, not so much recently, but that has been around <coughs> for a long time as trying to understand quantum mechanics in terms of. Okay, the next step is to wonder what to do with the non Boolean, non distributive structure of the quantum proposition, namely the subspace of H, because they don't have this Boolean thing which all the proposition have. Then you can say, ah, you so have to introduce a, a quantum logic. Again, if it's a way to speak, but of course, it's again, you are again guilty of naive realism about operator because you associate operator with properties of the system and explain with the no hidden variable theorem that that's a mistake. So that subspace of H uh, do not correspond to pre existing properties of the system. There is an active role of the measuring device. And this is clearly seen in, of course, the point point theory where you see how the system acts. But the worst step and that's a popular step at the end, because it's bad and it's popular, uh, is to introduce a new, new kind of logic, which is quantum logic. Okay? You say you're going to uh, do quantum logic, you're going to have a new logic, which will be the logic, not of proposition, not of subset, of set, but of subspaces of a little space. And this will define a new logic, because you associate to each subset, subspace, a proposition, a certain subspace, a proposition, and then you try to explain why this proposition not for the whole of the language. Quine, which was certainly one of the most famous analytical philosophers of the second half of the 20th century, he wrote, revision even of the logical law of the excluded middle mm -hmm. has been proposed as a means of simplifying quantum mechanics. And what difference is there in principle between such a shift and the shift whereby Kepler superseded Ptolemy Einstein, Newton, or Darwin, Aristotle. And this was put forward even more explicitly by Putnam at some point in his career, not all the time. So now he's saying, you know, empirical science, I mean, this is not exactly the same re logical revision that I mentioned in the excluded term. So excluded means that saying the proposition could be neither false nor true, okay? But the problem with, uh, he says, well, what's so strange? Science may force us to give up ordinary logic. And uh, what's the difference between having Kepler replacing Ptolemy, Einstein replacing Newton, and Darwin replacing Aristotle? Science, empirical science, forces us to change our logic. But the problem, in my view, is that ordinary logic is a prerequisite of all thinking, in particular thinking about the natural world. Saying that you should find logic in order to understand the natural world, to me, amounts to saying that you must renounce understanding that world. As Tim Morgan, who you know since he created this institute, said there is no point in arguing with somebody who does not believe in logic and agree with him. Again, John Bell, again, he, he always, I have a quote of John Bell for almost every situation. <laughs> when it is said that something is measured, it's difficult not to think of the result as referring to some pre-existing property of the object. This is to see, disregard both insistent that in quantum phenomena, the apparatus as well as the system is essentially important. When one forgets the whole of the apparatus as the world measurement makes all too likely, one despairs of ordinary logic, hence quantum logic. When one remembers the whole of the apparatus, ordinary logic is just fine. In the way boom, you never ever speak of non-classical logic. Now, there is another fashionable, yeah, I think I still have time, that's my last, I try. Uh, there is another rather fashionable approach to quantum mechanics that runs into trouble because of the no hidden variable theorems. And it's again something which you know you can't basically get across uh, when you talk to people. Something called the decoherent of consistent histories approach to quantum mechanics, which was being initiated by German and Hartle, Griffiths, and Omnes. So Griffiths, um, I mean, German is dead, but the three of us are still alive. Did anybody hear about that in this room? Or? <laughs> well, I will put Griffiths first. Okay. I have no problem with that because I think it's completely wrong, so okay. I don't mind. <laughs> I don't mind saying it. <laughs> no, no, I'm saying it. I'm, 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 I'm completely with you, just historically. Griffiths no, I agree, started the story. I agree, I agree. Griffiths started. You're right, you're right. With the 
not disagree about <coughs> the evaluation of this approach. No, okay. And so, only you have heard about that? I mean, how, you have heard about that? Okay, so some people have heard about that. So, I will explain the idea anyway. It's a very attractive idea. If you don't know, but of course those guys don't know about the human environment. I mean, if they, when you tell them, they don't get the point. But if, they, if you don't know, this is an extremely natural approach to quantum mechanics. So let me explain that. The basic idea is to assign probabilities to various histories of sequence of events that are supposed to be real events happening in the world independently of measurements. It assumes what I call operator democracy, namely the idea that all operators should be treated in the same way. And we can already see why this will be the source of the trouble if you think of that way in a life of because you just can't assign values to all of them. So that's the idea. A history could be something like this. The spin of the particle is oriented in this direction at time t1 and in that direction at time t2, etc. But of course, we already saw that you can't associate values of spin to a system. Or the particle goes to the upper state and ends up at point x on the second wall. The probability of such history is, of course, the same, that's the point, of course, as the one one would find, one would have, is the sequence of events were replaced by sequences of measurement. So they just take from the textbook the formula for the probability of result of a sequence of measurement, and they say, let's assume that this holds for histories in the world without measurement. So they're here in this okay? That's fine with me. Because you have to be careful, because that they realize. There's a mis an, an obvious mistake you could make, and that they don't make. For example, consider the following history of a spin with stationary dynamics, so nothing changed, nothing evolved. At time t0, you have sigma z equal plus 1. At time t1, sigma x equal 1. And at time t2, sigma z equal minus 1. Okay? That has probability 1 quarter. Well, again, because the probability would be the one of the measurement, and then the measurement of having that at time t1 is 1 half. And once you have that at time t1, having the other guys at time t2, it's again 1 half, so that's a quarter. Okay? But you have the same probability for the following history. Sigma z equal plus 1 initially, then sigma x equal minus 1 at the intermediate time, and again sigma z equal minus 1. Now if you want to use the ordinary rule of probability, you will have to sum all of these events, and the sum will have to be 1 half, 1 quarter plus 1 quarter. But if you sum all of these events, then you ignore what happened at time t1, and you get the history sigma z equal plus 1 at time t0, and sigma z equal minus 1 at time t2, which in the absence of dynamics has probability 0. So you cannot use the rule of probability for this example. Okay? That's fine. Or you could have another history. The particle goes to the upper state and is detected on the screen at some point x. It is detected to the screen, it goes to the lower state. Then, of course, you would have the sum. Again, you would like the probability of being detected at x should be the sum of the probabilities for those two sequences of events, but the probability will be detected at x when both theta open is different from the sum of the probabilities. That's, that's the two-slit experiment. And the means a priori there is a difficulty in assigning probabilities consistently to those histories. So that's something that the four guys I mentioned are perfectly aware of. Of course, if you have different sequences of events, is detected at the other state, is detected again on X, then of course you can assign probabilities to such pair of histories because the detection in effect collapses the wave function and does destroy the interference phenomena. But they want to associate real events in the world, not measurement. It's measurement just textbook, quantum mechanics, that's fine. But they want to think they want to think realistically about these events. And that's a pre I should praise them for doing so. That's why they've introduced condition of decoherence between members of a family of histories in such a way as to allow the, probability, the application of the usual rule of probability to that family. So they, def they define basically who uh, families so that for those families of history, you can apply the usual rule that uh, you sum the probability of the event and then it's you know, it added to one, etc. But I'm not going to go into those rules. Because they run into trouble for things that happen at a given time. 
Uh, given time, everything is decoherent. There is no problem with decoherence. The decoherence comes when you want to combine events at different times. Indeed, the originality and the merit of the approach that it tries to make sense of politics of real events happening in the world whether you observe them or not. If it did not try to do that, there would be nothing new since the formulas are just the usual quantum mechanical one for combining the trading equation and the collapse one. So if there are these different events correspond to measurement, then in between you have the shredding equation, and that is specified time, you just project, you just collapse. Okay. And that gives you a certain formative point. Okay? Of course, these things, if you don't think of real event <coughs> measurement, then it's standard quantum. Griffiths was very explicit about the goal. One can show that a properly constructed measuring apparatus will reveal a property that the measured system had before the measurement. This is exactly what I've been saying in the noise environment. I'm sure that it's impossible. But he's saying that. He's, saying, he's not saying what you say. He doesn't care about statistics. He says the properly constructed measuring will reveal a property that the system has and might well have lost during the measurement. The probabilities calculated for measurement outcome are identical to those obtained by the usual rules in, in found in textbooks. What is different is that by employing suitable families of history, one can show that measurement actually measures something that is there rather than producing a mysterious collapse of the quantum of the wave function. So they certainly want to have realistic quantum mechanics. However, they take real events as values taken by arbitrary observable. This leads to a problem using the Norwegian variable theorem in a certain way. And that was raised in paper by Goldstein and others. A uh, problem which exists to consider history as a single time and for which the decoherence condition is clearly satisfied. So that's why he did not explain what it is. You can find it in the articles. What he did, what he took is use an example due to Lucien Hardin. Goldstein was able to show with four decoherent histories that you run into a contradiction. Now, the four quantities Sorry, quick question. Is this Griffiths, the same Griffiths who writes like introductory undergrad textbooks? No, no, no. It's called the Griffiths, no. But I don't know the other one, by the way. It's a great book. Introduction to what? It's very basic. Like He writes basic first, second year undergrad textbooks. Yeah, quantum Anyway. I'm not going to tell you what these four quantities, four operators are. They are described in the appendix of my slides, so you can read them there. But I just want to emphasize the, the reason. They are associated with a pair of stream one half particles, with an ABC, so these are operators, so from Griffiths and Omnes' point of view and so on, they correspond to actual events in the world, and they have the following property. A and C, commute, so they can be measured simultaneously. <coughs> and if you get A equal 1, then necessarily C is 1. B and D can be measured simultaneously, and you get B equal 1, then D is 1. C and D can be measured simultaneously, but it never happens that you have both C equal 1 and D equal 1. And A and B can be measured simultaneously, and sometimes happen that both A equal 1 and D equal 1. 9% of the time. So I've repeated the four rules here. Each of these four statements correspond to a different history, since both quantities in each of the pair can be measured simultaneously, and we are considering everything at a single time. So each of these histories is supposed to be true in the world, independently of measurement. So you could assign probabilities to those events in a consistent way. For example, since A and B, you get A equal 1 and C equal 1, then the point is that C equal 1, given that A equal 1 is equal to 1. Okay, you can assign probabilities like that. Now I've repeated the whole. But the problem is that this four statement is very interesting from the point of view of logic. Putting this four statement together cannot all be true because when it happens that A equal 1 and B equal 1, as it sometimes does by, rule f by example 4, you must have by 1 and 2, C equal 1 and D equal 1. Because if A equal 1, then C equal 1. If so sometimes that happens, and that's never the case. Okay? So the four theory, the four stories contradict each other. 
course, some of them could be true, like three of them could be true and not the fourth one. But there's nothing really natural to distinguish them. And then it's an interesting philosophical question. You know, each of the statements is true if they all refer to results of Rajan. But of course, in the four operator A, B, C, don't commute all to all, all with it respect to each other. These two commute, these two commute, etc. but not all four of them. Then there is no contradiction because the measurements are different. And of course, they may perturb the system, as we see in the collapse rule or analysis of measurement in the boy bone. The contradiction is similar to what happens with the no hidden variable theorem. Once you think that measured values correspond to real events. A stress by Goldstein in consistency is a problem only from the decay and history point of view. You see, for orthodox quantum theory, and in fact, even for Romeo mechanics, the four statements above is used properly are not inconsistent because they then would refer merely to the outcomes of four different experiments so that the properties would refer, in effect, to four different ensembles. However, the whole point of decoherent history is, is that such statements refer directly not to what would happen where certain experiments to be performed, but to the probabilities of occurrence of histories themselves, regardless of whether, regardless of whether any such experiments are performed. And of course, the response from Gellner and Hunter and uh, Griffith and so on, they basically say there is no decoherent history involving A, B, C, and D because those four guys don't all commute. Because A and D don't commute, nor can B and C. But that answer, that's interesting from a logical point of view. They miss the point, which is that each decoherent history is supposed to be a statement about real event in the world to which true values can be assigned. So each of the above statements is meant to be true, but they cannot all be true, since taken together they lead to a contradiction. And then we have infinite discussion, Shelley had had, and me too, by the way infinite discussion with Griffith, but Griffith say, well, but there is a rule now that you can't combine two different histories. You, you can say P is true, Q is true, but P and Q is meaningless. Again, change the logic. I don't understand what that means. I just don't understand. And then of course Shelley has said, well, can I write P in one page and Q in the other page, and then can I combine both pages? I mean, there have been infinite discussion with Griffith about that. The next step is similar to quantum logic. Redefine the rules through which true values are assigned. <laughs> then we see P is true, Q is true, then P and Q is true. The only way to maintain that each the proposition is true is to ban these rules in proposition A to D taken together leads to contradiction. So that, I think, is silly. So the decoherent history approach to make two things at once, naive realism about operators, trying to think that operators correspond to real events in the world and automatic logic, at least in the case. Mm -hmm. Now we'll maybe briefly explain how we assign probabilities in Bolivian mechanics to histories. Because you do. I thought your histories are trajectories of particles. So if you give a point to position, then you give a point to trajectory. Now let's go back to that picture. You have a probability distribution, which is the size square for each particle position at the initial time, and therefore probability distribution on all the trajectories since each trajectory is associated to an initial condition, okay? So for example, you can give the probability uh, of the probability of going to that slit and ending up at that point, okay? Or going to that slit and ending up at that point, okay? But you can do it in a consistent way. Indeed, if the point X is in the upper half, then the probability of going through the lower slit and ending at x is zero, while the conditional probability of going through the upper slit, given that it ends at x is one, if x is there, and vice versa. So there is no inconsistency in this assignment of probability. The probability density of ending at x is the sum of ending at there, is the sum of the probability of going through the upper slit and ending there, and the probability of going through the lower slit and ending there because one is whatever it is, and the other is zero. So you can add zero, it doesn't change anything. Okay? So that sounds counterintuitive, but this assignment of probabilities is consistent, and the counterintuitive nature arises solely from quantum mechanical intuition that is deeply linked with results of measurement. 
Because you think, ah, but if I measure through which kit, don't measure through which kit. These are real events in the world. This does what the consistent historians want to do. But of course, by not assigning values to all operators, but only to trajectories. Finally, let me mention that there is a general notion. Rodrigue wanted me to go into that, but it's too, too much. Uh, called a positive operator value measure, which is a generalization of the self adjunct operator and tells you what the most general measurement will be, and that I refer to you to uh, the lectures. So the lesson from the lecture is again the Jacob Schwartz. You see, be realist, because there is no sense in not being realist, it doesn't make any sense for a you not to be realist, but be aware of naive realism about operators. And when dealing with fancy mathematics, remember Jacob Schwartz and Weiss. And that's of course true for uh, string theories, for uh, quantum cosmologists, to, uh, to quantum logic, uh, uh, decorative histories, you see? Always to think about that. So there I the proof of the Marvin theorem. And I guess uh, let me still finish my lectures by a few words since I'm still in time. Um, you see, I hope you will leave this school at least understanding that there is no solution in standard quantum mechanics, in, in the in Copenhagen quantum mechanics. First of all, nowadays, if you ask people what Copenhagen means, they really don't know what to answer. If you go in more, you won't understand, if you are honest. For a long time, I think it has been the naked king story. When I was a student, somebody said, oh, I don't know something, ha, 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 go explain it. And then the uh, student said, oh, you know, he gets scared and uh, doesn't know what to, what to say. So to me, it seems that this time is over and we should be allowed to ask what's going on. Now, we have seen in this school three different answers. I've already stated my objections to the many world and the GRW type theories. GRW being that it's true only if quantum mechanics is false, and you know, and many worlds are probably the statistics, but that's not repeat. For the Roy Bohm, there are certain, maybe I will be a little bit more modest than I was because I just wanted to weaken your interest in it. The De Roy Bohm theory, you see, it, First of all, well, first of all, it clarifies what's going on. It explains that, after all, there can be trajectories. It explains how measurement works. It explains uh, why what is going on with the no hidden variable theorem, because actually there are no values that you reveal in the measurements in interaction. It explains what the interaction is. It's not a deus ex machina. Uh, it, it explains via dynamical system ideas the origin of the probabilities in quantum mechanics in a consistent way because of equivalence. It sheds light on non-locality, which is a, a feature of the world, as I try to explain my opinion, that if we are better than that. So to me, it does really a lot. But on the other hand, there are certain things which you could say, is that the, 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 boom, the guiding equation is not the only equation we can have that would be empirically consistent. So you could modify the, the you know, the guiding equation, you can make it stochastic even if that makes you happy, because some people don't like determinism, so make it stochastic if you want. And then, of course, every individual particle will follow a different trajectory than it follows in this theory. But, of course, the statistics will be the same, okay? Then, you could say, who cares about, then who cares about the trajectories? Well, in fact, I don't care so much about the trajectories, except that I think consistently that they are there. Because in the end, you can't actually observe trajectories. So that's an argument usually against Bohm. You can't observe these trajectories the way you need them. Well, the problem is that I can observe with arbitrary precision the position of the particle at any given time. And I'm supposed to say that it doesn't have a position when I don't observe it. I don't see a reason for that. So, and we have a consistent story that assumes these trajectories, and uh, then we get uh, we can see that we can actually consistently think that after the trajectories. So the, the, the real lesson of the Braille bomb is that it 
But for me, it carries what quantum mechanics is. It's not a different theory. Quantum mechanics is not a theory about the world, but only an algorithm about predicting the results of my own. And then, and if you want to make it into in the world, like Gabriel and Hartle tried to do, and if it's anonymous, then you run into problems. Inconsistencies because of the way you manage them, which is very important to understand that. But the usefulness of the world goal is not in these trajectories. I don't care about these trajectories so much, except that I can think consistently and solve the problem that it solves. But it's true that I can't do predictions that will go beyond quantum mechanics, only quantum mechanics, and that's due to quantum equilibrium. That's a further chapter which I can't explain now, but it's sort of like if you were in equilibrium classically, and of course we wouldn't be here, there will be no structure, and then there will be no, uh, no structure and no nothing, and then we would be uh, in a situation where we can't, uh, you know, have any, you can't do any experiments or anything, and in quantum equilibrium there are certain limitations to our knowledge related to this quantum equilibrium. If the world was not in quantum equilibrium, then you could do a lot more, because you could also send signals instantaneously and things like that, but you could measure trajectories and so on. That's explained by Anthony Valentini, who has explored the mathematical structure of non equilibrium uh, movement mechanics. So that's, you know. Uh, but, but, but the point for me is that, you see, Bromian mechanics takes care of two assertions, which have been repeated over and over again by physicists, by philosophers, by popularizers of science. One is that determinism is dead after quantum mechanics. And two, which is more important for me, is that there is an essential role of the observer, of the apparatus, of the measurement device, whatever. Okay? Now, everything is back to physics. Everything, and you know, everything is back to classical mechanics. Just the trajectories are not the usual ones, but it's just matter in motion, like electromagnetism, like classical mechanics, and like general relativity, like all of physics. We're just talking about trajectories of particles. And to me, of course, if you like, you would say what I say is not very sexy, but I think also I like it not to be sexy. I like something which is not mystical and which is back to ordinary 18th century materialism. I mean, it's not something different from uh, you know, because uh, you know, all these uh, strange statements. And it gets rid of entire libraries of books. You know, uh, you must end in the essay on underst human understanding saying committed to the flames, and you commit to the flame lots of books about quantum mechanics and the consequence of quantum mechanics. I'm not even talking about uh, mystical books or pseudoscientific books, but uh, all kinds of statements in the physics and you know, physics literature. And that, I think, is a great achievement. Now, of course, in practice, you can forget about the trajectories because what you predict will be the usual prediction. You just understand what's going on. And if you don't care about understanding what's going on, then I don't know why you came here. I don't know what's the point. But, and many people don't care. And I think people do very well. If I was a practical physicist, now I s devote what is left of my life to try to make Bohmian or the Bray Bohm better known, better understood, etc. But, uh, you know, if I was a practical physicist and I would learn about that, I would be happy. And then I would say, okay, but now I don't care. I don't have to compute these trajectories. And, you know, since I'm not sure what the true equation of motion is, since there are versions of that, I can never know what the true trajectory of a single particle is, but who cares? The point is that you can have a consistent picture of it. So I, 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 I mean, I think Audrey has an answer to that because there have been 
all kinds of papers about surrealistic Gaudian trajectories and things like that where people get, the, because they have some quantum intuition, they get the wrong picture about what the Gaudian parts are, but maybe you can say something about it. Yes, I, I can uh, say something. Um, uh, you, you've seen examples where different experiments um, are can be counted as measurements of the same quantum observable. So for example, Matthias and John, they both talked about this experiment where you, you take it, or two versions of the stein gerlach experiment <coughs> that both, both measure sigma z. Once you take the ordinary stein gerlach experiment and once you reverse the poles of the, um, of the magnet <coughs> and then um, uh, it's, uh, it's a, uh, and you also reverse the labeling of the outcomes. Uh, so reversing the poles will have the consequence that the spin up part actually goes down, but then you call that a spin up, um, and so on. And uh, the, so this is another experiment that counts as a quantum measurement of sigma z, although it actually produces different outcomes. Uh, something similar you can also do with the, with the position observable. So people have come up with experiments uh, for which, um, let's say, let, let's talk about, say, two positions. So you can <coughs> feed the experiment with the superposition of, um, of a wave packet here and a wave packet there. <coughs> and then you do an experiment with that, um, and uh, um, the, the experiment has two outcomes and the um, probability of the first outcome is actually the norm squared of the packet here, and the probability of the other outcome is actually the norm squared of the packet there. But that, but at the same time, this experiment doesn't actually measure the position. So for example, uh, with, with Wheeler's delayed choice, you have these situations like where the, <coughs> um, um, where the where the Bohmian particle switches from one wave packet to the other. So in basically Wheeler's delay choice experiment is uh, an experiment of that kind where you, uh, in a sense, which counts as a measurement of the, of the position of the particle when it passes the slits. So it's kind of a measurement of the observable, of, of the observable which slit. But uh, because of the way it is arranged, you, so the, the, the simplest way of measuring that observable, the which slit observable, would be to put a detector directly into one of the slits. As soon as the particle passes there, the detector detects it. Okay, but uh, with this more complicated arrangement, uh, you can set it up in such a way that actually the, the outcomes uh, will, be, will have the same probabilities, um, but it will not actually measure which slit the, the Bohmian particle went through. So it does not measure position, but it, it is a quantum measurement of the position observable. That sounds paradoxical, but I mean the, the meaning is just that uh, quantum measurements, well, Jean said measurements don't measure, observations don't observe. So sometimes these quantum measurements are not, don't reveal actual values of actual variables. And in this case, for position in Bohmian mechanics, there is an actual variable, but this measurement, or this experiment that's usually called a quantum measurement, does not reveal the value of that variable. Okay, uh, so that can easily bring you into situations where you have, um, where you have experiments that are measurements of position observable, but the result disagrees with, the, with, the, with where the particle actually was. And then, of course, people who don't like Bohmian mechanics, they will formulate it by saying, oh, look, um, you measured, uh, you had a uh, position measurement, but Bohm had the wrong position for the particle. The Bohmian particle went the wrong way. I would say the other way around. Uh, I mean, the particle went where it went, and then this, this experiment, w which was uh, claimed to be a position measurement, uh, had the wrong result. But which is uh, because the word measurement, I mean, because in quantum mechanics uh, there's always this tendency to use the word measurement in a kind of exaggerated way. And uh, then, um, but you could say, um, well, as an operational definition of, uh, of a position measurement, I can also, uh, so if I keep in mind that measurement um, 
doesn't mean doesn't have to be a literal measurement, then I can of course also consider these experiments that are quantum measurements of the position observable. Mm -hmm. And uh, then I can also consider variants of that. So Lev introduced several um, uh, several uh, operational definitions of uh, of the positions of particles, in particular for the uh, for the more um, interesting uh, and uh, non-trivial case of the position kind of uh, prior to the, the position in the past. And I mean, these are, are, are nice as operational definitions, but <clears throat> you, shouldn't, um, you shouldn't take for granted that these definitions actually reproduce where the particle actually was. So I think this is what, uh, what is shown from the, that, that's the meaning, I would say, between, of the disagreement between the Bohmian trajectory and the results of these. Uh, also, I mean, this, I guess, also comes across from the fact that you could have different um, uh, operational definitions of where the particle went. So, Lev had the, the weak trace and, the, um, and the several others. That was his right column on his slide. <clears throat> and they, they disagree with each other. So, they are kind of, um, they are um, interesting questions you can ask. But, uh, um, well, in, in Bohmian mechanics, where you actually have facts about where the particle was, then these methods don't necessarily reveal where the particle actually went. I think many body physics, statistical physics, from the way. So how do I combine Bohm with 10 to 10 to 6? How do you do it in classical physics? The same thing. Classical physics, you can also do statistical physics assuming uh, that you tend to Yeah, well, if you want to do quantum statistical mechanics, then again, that is a separate chapter which I can't go into, but uh, that's discussed uh, in other lecture. In the lectures on he has lectures on statistical mechanics and then he discuss quantum statistical mechanics. That exists too, and you can think of it in your own way. Yeah. Yeah. It doesn't change anything. Well, yeah, I can also say something to that. It, it, it couldn't be more straightforward. You simply assume that uh, you, you uh, can also apply Bohmian mechanics to this big system, any number of particles n, say 10 to the 26. So you have a wave function of 10 to the 26 particles. You have positions of 10 to the 26 particles. Then you run the equations, something the, the theory will tell you this and this happens. Now you can also do statistics with that, like you can assume, let's start with a random wave function from a certain um, uh, energy shell or something. Okay. And it's supplementary equation for this position. Yes, um, I mean, um, in, in these cases, for these kinds of applications, it's usually um, uh, not, not particularly useful to actually compute the trajectories. The, the one fact about the trajectory that, it, uh, that is most relevant is to know that in the end, the, uh, the probability distribution of the positions or of the configurations will be the psi squared distribution. And then you will have a definite outcome by the psi squared distribution. Yeah. Um, as far as I know, uh, over the later years, developed some theories about mentality, but we will detect that somehow the pilot wave has some sort of rationality and guides the particle in a rational way for H marks. So can you comment on that a little bit? No. No, because for me, Boom is Boom 1952. Boom afterwards, he even forgot his own theory in the 60s and then developed another theory. Boom was more ambitious than what I am. Boom was trying to find a, a theory going beyond quantum mechanics. So he was not so interested in clarifying quantum mechanics, which is the mother's goal that I assigned to that theory. And then, of course, it's true that later in his life, he was very isolated. Bohm, remember Bohm had problems with the McCarthy period. He had to basically flee to Brazil or find a job in Brazil. He couldn't find one. He was expelled from Princeton University. And then he had to go to Brazil and then to Israel and then finally to England. And even in England, he was made member of the Royal Society two years before his death. He was very marginal. And then he got into contact with people like Krishna Murti and uh, people who are more mystical, I would say. But I blame it on his isolation. The fact that the physicists never 
even even says that. I mean, he says that even he was more hurt by the fact that people were not uh, paying any attention to his theory than even the problem he had with McCarthy. So uh, it's a very tragic figure. And the Pride is a strange, the Pride is different because the Pride had a lot of prize. He was president of the French Academy of Science, of the f physics part, and he was very, you know, he had a lot of recognition in some sense, but now he's totally going on in France. I mean, maybe, I don't know if you didn't agree with me, but I think that the, the French uh, are totally forgotten, forgotten the person who is, in my view, the best uh, physicist, French physicist of the 20th century. And he's totally going on, it's very strange. The mathematicians have done more or less the same thing with Poincaré for a long time, so I found that strange too, but the, 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 the boy is a real scandal, I think, because he, he, he did not only the pilot wave theory, he also did other things. And uh, he wrote lots of books about quantum mechanics which are probably clearer than uh, the, the standard ones. It's a long story which I don't really completely understand of why he has been so marginalized in France, but he has been very rationalized. Also, I grow for different reasons. He has a lot of institutional recognition, and I grow, but then he's been uh, forgotten by everybody. And France is really a, the country which is more, most boring of all. I mean, when we discuss with phys about physics, which French physics is about quantum mechanics, it's, I mean, I think the work of Hitler and, uh, and uh, Rodney and others in Germany. Uh, I think it's maybe you know, US Germans, but it seems to me that the situation is more open in Germany, that Martin and Chile have made the situation more open in, uh, in the United States, but maybe in Italy, I don't know, in Zambia has been able to do something, but in France it seems to me that you get strict volume of galaxy to an extreme extent that there's no appreciation of the crime whatsoever. Maybe I can add an, another reaction to, to the question. I, I would say uh, kind of Bohm's uh, more philosophical speculations later in his life are kind of independent of his physics work. Um, yeah. yeah. But the, but problem, the problem that the people who like Bohm, I mean, you mentioned that you know, there are more people who like Bohm because of the speculation than the people who like Bohm because of the 1952 papers. That's, that's because the problem. Uh, I, and just comment a little bit about uh, what you said about the boy. Uh, I work very often I prefer in, in France people being extremely critical with respect to the boy and uh, accusing him of being uh, responsible for uh, France non participating in uh, development of quantum mechanics, saying that uh, he was he, his uh, importance was so so big because what you said it's true he had a very important position and uh, his uh, his propositions his way was just wrong and it uh, uh, was impediment for the uh, yeah. I know French, I, yeah I know this the, this is maybe not uh, very often said publicly but that's uh, the more or less uh, existing uh, opinion of many people in yeah, but I think there are other reasons why, you see, the French lost a lot of scientists during World War I, uh, and uh, the, the, the problem of French science after World War I and even after World War II can't be only blamed on the Breuil. I don't think the Breuil was wrong. The Breuil, I, I don't see in what sense the Breuil was against developing quantum mechanics because he's written all these books about quantum mechanics. But it's true that in his book he was asking fundamental questions which people didn't want to hear about. In the 60s, when they really developed then, of course, French physics took off, but uh, then they didn't want to hear about any fundamental question, I still don't. I just want to support and comment uh, kind of personal evidence. In 89, it was conference in Columbia, South Carolina, around about 30. And uh, I took a bond to Charleston, which is kind of two and a half hours drive, and back, and, and then we had some drive in the carriage there. I spent one day with Bohm. And uh, determinism uh, was important for me even then. And I, so I asked uh, Bohm, uh, uh, look, uh, there is this nice solution. Uh, this is uh, maybe a possibility for a final theory. The 
Bohmian theory, even then I prefer many words, but Bohm is number two. Uh, and uh, he kind of said, you are completely wrong. In the, there is no such thing like final theory. We never find final oh, yeah, theory. That's right, that's right. Uh, but uh, all this Bohmian uh, mechanics, it's kind of a way so to go forward. He hoped uh, that uh, out of this, uh, the quantum mechanic, he was looking for new theory. So yeah, yeah. then the quantum mechanics will be like uh, classical mechanics as a, some kind of uh, in particular limit come from quantum mechanics and the quantum mechanics in particular limit will come from the true uh, next theory and again it will not be a final theory he said looking for a final theory it's nonsense yeah, he, from he, his he, point he, of view he strongly thought that if, he, if you read this more popular book which is I think is very very interesting it's causality and chance in physics it's a, it's a more philosophical book which he wrote in the 50s, so after the 52 theory. It's, uh, there, of course, it's very clear about the idea that there will never any final theory. That was his philosophical belief. But uh, what is funny with Bohm is that orthodox people usually refer to him because he wrote also a book in 1951, which is called Quantum Theory, and the 51 book is an orthodox textbook, and it's in that textbook that he reformulated the PR paradox in terms of spins, which I've been using all the time. I never mentioned the original PR paper. And, and that's an orthodox book. But it's interesting, he, he, he gave this book to Einstein, and then he went to see Einstein, and Einstein talked, talked him out of it, as he said to Gellman. So he came back from the Institute of the University. Gellman was there, and he told Gellman, now Einstein took me out of it. It's very strange, Bohm, because Bohm was appreciated. Feynman, for example, knew Bohm, he knew his theory, he appreciated Bohm, he thought Bohm was extremely smart, but nevertheless he made these comments about uh, the double state experiment. And he must have known that Bohm does solve the, uh, the problem of the double state experiment. The whole history of Bohm and the Boyle, and also Bell, his understanding of Bell, all this is in my book, by the way, this is extremely fascinating and uh, lovely. Yeah, maybe we can have one more question. Uh, right, so, so far, from my understanding, uh, like the, one of the virtues that you've outlined of Bohm's theory is the fact that it's embedded on real space compared to, uh, again, like some everyone is just like hyper space, that, that's all there is. But, but I feel like if, if you take that view seriously, then there's some implicit conclusions that you conclude from it. So, for example, in cosmology, we have something called like it's a general theorem in mathematics, but it's called the bohm proof Vilenkin theorem, which essentially uh, says that as long as you have an expanding space-time, at some point, the classical description of space-time breaks down. Now to me, I feel like if you're a Bohmian, then you have, uh, you'll have to admit one of two things. Either the point of the classical description of space-time breaks down, that's when you have the uh, the universe had a beginning. I mean, you have to assume that the universe had a beginning. Or you have to say that Bohmian mechanics is incomplete because it can only describe uh, quantum mechanics in a classical space time. Uh, if you, because if, if you believe that the universe is does not have a beginning and it's just a classical description that breaks down that point, that, then you can't use Bohmian mechanics to describe that non classical region without like talking about some, some sort of abstract space or like uh, some addition to classical space. You have to, you, you, as a punishment, you have to be three times that sentence. <laughs> <laughs> no, because, you see, the, it's not the correct attitude. I, don't, I think you start to appreciate Bohm and then you should maybe really clarify what it is. Because I think before coming here, you didn't really know what it was from what we talked privately, okay? So I think you should really appreciate it and then worry about fancy things like the beginning of the universe, etc. There is a Bohemian who has been working on that and the compatriot of my name was Troy. And you can find papers by him and Brazil. And maybe uh, Rodrigo knows more about that, or maybe Matthias, I don't know. But they, people have been thinking in Bohemian terms about uh, the beginning time. And there's, uh, there are different possibilities whether the things bounce back and uh, whether they. I mean, 
you, you can discuss this in longer terms. But the abstract mathematics, you always, always ask yourself, because I made a mistake when I was young to go into abstract mathematics. In fact, I was puzzled by quantum mechanics, and I thought the solution would come from studying distribution and uh, things like that, which is totally misleading. So I warn you against trying to find a solution in abstract mathematics. Abstract mathematics, of course, is fine for the sake of itself. And of course, it's also important in physics to have certain correct mathematical statements. But you should always worry about the physical meaning of what you're doing. And it's not so clear. Okay, so okay let's end of the torture. <laughs> <laughs> let's thank John again. Maybe